It's been another few months of extremely hard science projects, so it's once again time to do something a little bit different. I don't talk about it much, but when I'm stressing out over getting a video finished, I tend to do one of two things. Either cook, or bake. Since I'm not Nile Red, cooking is the only chemistry I can safely eat without it killing me, and I love the relaxing zen of focusing all of your effort onto a new dish. And I almost always choose something that's way outside of my current skill set, so I'm forced to pay it all of my attention to try and get it right. The goal being that each new thing is, in some small way, the best I've ever made. Maybe it's the best pie, or the best entree, or whatever else. Or maybe it's a total failure, and I'll have learned a lot along the way. It's just a nice way to unwind and let my brain do something else other than science, and I often think up solutions to problems while I'm cooking. One of my all-time favorite anime is called Shokugeki no Soma, or Food Wars in English. As you've probably gathered by now, it's an anime focused on food, and while I love it for the characters and story, the recipes are all real and are legitimately some of the best things I have ever tasted. So from time to time, I try and recreate some of them. While I was working on the Sun Illuminescence video, I needed a break from editing the 27 minute long video and decided to make this. The dish's title is Eggs Benedict Dawn Fit for a Queen, and I kid you not, it is one of the best things I have ever eaten. It's from the manga and hasn't shown up in the show yet, but it's basically the last dish of the series and is a fitting send-off. So today we're going to go through all the pieces of this amazing dish and I think have a lot of fun. The character that makes the dish was given the challenge of creating something the world has never seen, and so serves up this very Asian twist on Eggs Benedict. Classic Eggs Benedict consists of four main parts. An English muffin, or some sort of bread as a base. Some sort of pork product, usually ham, but prosciutto, bacon, or other cuts can be used. Here I'm going with prosciutto. Finally, a poached egg, which is still runny, is topped with hollandaise sauce, which is basically fancy warm mayonnaise. This shot was actually the very first time that I've made Eggs Benedict, and considering I'd never so much as poached an egg before this, I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. The version we'll be making today puts a twist on every layer. Instead of bread, the recipe uses a flavorful bowl of rice mixed with kombu and shiso leaves. For the pork, a thick cut pork chop grilled to golden perfection is used. The egg is the most fun, and rather than poaching it, it's first frozen, peeled, and then battered and deep fried. And the hollandaise sauce is a tangy, slightly spicy variation with soy sauce and imitation yuzu kosho in it. Now, I don't know about you, but my stomach is starting to rumble, so let's jump right in and get cooking. Let's start on the rice. I'm using long grain jasmine rice for this, and I'm only making a small amount, so feel free to scale this up. I usually suck at making rice, so I'm just going to use my rice cooker for this. One cup of rice and one and a half cups of water are added to the pot and mixed to suspend everything. Then approximately a three inch square of kombu is added on top. Kombu is a type of kelp that is one of the central ingredients in a lot of Japanese cooking. It's basically sheets of umami and I love cooking with it. It'll soften as the rice cooks and imbue the whole pot with some of the scent and flavor of the kelp. With that going, we can work on the other pieces. I started by setting up a pot of vegetable oil for frying as it'll take a while to heat up. Now let's tackle the hollandaise. I mentioned it contains imitation yuzu kosho and some soy sauce. Yuzu kosho is a mixture of citrus zest and chili paste, typically made from yuzu citrus, a variety from Japan. But here in Canada, we don't have yuzu trees, so to make something reasonably close, a mix of orange and lime zest makes a great stand-in. So using a microplane, or grater if you don't have one, zest two oranges and four limes. This will give a good balance that will reasonably approximate yuzu zest, but obviously, if you've got the real thing, use it. Once all the zest is collected, we can add the rest of our ingredients. First, a tablespoon of chili paste. Here I'm using sambal olek because it's what I had. I think two tablespoons of this stuff would have actually been nice, but adjust to the level of spiciness you prefer. Then, three tablespoons of lemon juice and one to two tablespoons of soy sauce. Give it all a mix and we're ready to make the hollandaise. Hollandaise is a notoriously annoying sauce to make, but for small quantities like this, I find making it in a blender is the fastest and easily the most consistent method. You can use a standard blender, an immersion blender, or in my case, I'll be using a magic bullet. First, we melt half a cup of butter on the stove until it just starts to foam. Then we separate three eggs into whites and yolks, adding the yolks to the blender and saving the whites to either be eaten later or thrown out. Add our zest and spice mix to the yolk and blend thoroughly. Now, while the butter is still hot, we add it in small portions to our spicy yolk mixture and blend well between additions. You want to start with a small quantity of the butter to temper the eggs and prevent them from cooking too fast and making a lumpy hollandaise. 
but when it's all added and blended together, you should be left with a perfect and delicious hollandaise that should easily coat the back of a spoon. Give it a taste and add any salt or make any other changes as necessary, and it's ready to go. The pork chop is by far the easiest part of this, and all that's needed is to season both sides with salt and pepper, and then sear it off in a pan. Here I'm using a cast iron skillet because it's what I have. You want golden brown on both sides and cooked through. By now the oil should be basically a temp, so let's talk eggs and batter. The eggs I froze the night before so that they were totally solid. It's okay if the shell splits, mine occasionally did. To peel them, use the back of a knife to make a bunch of indents on the shell and weaken it. Then find either a spot where there's an air bubble or a crack in the shell and start peeling. As the heat from your hand slightly melts the white, the shell should release, but you may need to get a few chunks off first. Once the majority of the shell is off, a quick rinse in cold water to get any remaining bits off is all that's needed to get the egg ready. Now I like to put it back into the freezer while we work on the batter so that it doesn't melt. You can also prep several eggs this way and have them all ready for right before you go to fry them. We'll be making a very simple tempura batter which starts as one cup of all-purpose flour. To that we add one whole egg and start mixing. Now we need to add one cup of ice water very slowly. First we add a small amount of the water, just enough so that you can beat the batter into a thick but smooth paste. This way you can work out any lumps before the batter is too thin to mix properly. Then add the rest of the water and mix well. You should end up with a smooth, thin batter. Okay, our oil is hot, our batter is ready, and the egg is peeled, so let's get frying. Dunk the egg in the batter, make sure it's fully covered, and then straight into oil that's 375 degrees Fahrenheit or 190 degrees Celsius. The egg should almost instantly form this fluffy exterior and start to float. If it gets stuck in the bottom, just give it a gentle nudge to unstick it. Now we just let it cook until the outside is golden brown. We want it to cook just long enough for the whites to be set, but the yolk to remain runny. Honestly, this is my new favorite way to make eggs. The texture is so fun, and they are absolutely delicious like this. Moving on, it's finally time for assembly. Open up the rice cooker and fish out the kombu. We're going to chop this as well as some shiso leaves. Shiso, also known as perilla, is a plant in the mint family, but doesn't really taste minty. It just sort of tastes like what it tastes like, and trying to describe it is like trying to describe the color red. You can never really do it justice. But it's a bit spicy and tangy and really a wonderful herb to work with. I'm saving one really nice leaf to be battered and fried as a garnish. You can get this stuff at some Asian markets, but you may need to look around as it's not something that's usually carried in most grocery stores. Chop the kombu and shiso into small slivers and then collect our other pieces for assembly. Here we have the rested pork chop, our egg, the kombu and shiso, and the fried shiso leaf for garnish. Start with a nice helping of rice and mix in some of the kombu and shiso. Then chop up the pork chop and add it on top. Make sure that it's flat so that the egg can be perched on top of the pile. And finally, we finish with a generous portion of our delicious hollandaise and add our garnish. And that's all there is to it. Eggs Benedict on, fit for a queen is served, and honestly, any queen would be lucky to have it. When you split the egg, sure enough, the yolk is still a little bit runny, but freezing the egg makes the yolk sort of congeal a bit and gives it an even better texture than usual, almost akin to a six-minute egg. And the crisp shell gives it an awesome texture that's really fun to eat. The pork chop is nice, but having made this a few times now, I'm thinking that maybe a thick-cut broiled pork belly might be a better option. The hollandaise is awesome, and its punchy, vibrant flavor really livens up the dish, and the tart, solid flavors of the kombu and shiso in the rice balance it out nicely. I didn't want to waste the oranges and extra batter I had left over, so for a fun dessert, I also battered and fried some of the orange slices, and they came out amazing. All in all, this is a super fun dish, and I highly recommend giving it a try. It doesn't really require much in the way of exotic ingredients, and is actually surprisingly easy to make. The biggest challenge is just timing everything so that all the pieces are done at the same time so the dish is all hot when served. But that's where I think I'll leave it for this episode. If you like these more food-centric episodes, let me know in the comments, as I'd love to do them from time to time between the usual science and engineering. They're fun to film, easy to edit, and so it's a nice change of pace from the near 30-minute monster episodes I've been making lately. If there's other recipes or things you want me to try and make, leave suggestions down in the comments. I also recently picked up the Noma Guide to Fermentation and a Vacuum Sealer, so maybe we'll take a little trip to Fermentation Station and make some artisanally rotted food. I post most of my cooking adventures on Instagram, so head over there if me messing around with this stuff is something you're interested in. As always, I need to say a huge thank you to my many patrons, channel members, and supporters on Ko-fi that make these videos possible. If you're new to the channel and enjoyed, then feel free to subscribe and ring that bell to see when I post new videos. If you're looking for more of my usual science projects, click the links you see on the screen. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.